All right, I am up next. I MC myself here again. Uh, so real quickly, I whoa, am I too loud? Oh, is that there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, a couple of announcements I forgot this morning. Uh, for so for the exhibitors uh, setting up in the expo this morning, you should all have received a schedule from the expo company. Uh, for the poster presenters. Uh, you can go over and set up your posters if you have not already starting at the AM break. Um, so we had some questions about that. And uh, I think that's it. Okay. Um, I'm going to get rolling then. Uh, this presentation is about SIGMF. Uh, so can I get a quick show of hands for anyone who's actually, who has heard of SIGMF? More than I anticipated. Okay. This is, this is, this is cool. Awesome. Uh, so SIGMF started in February at the DARPA Hack Fest in Brussels, and one of the problem statements that Tom put forward at the time was uh, how, basically how do we make use of large recordings? Uh, I'm sure anyone who, who creates recording of samples has done that thing where you find a folder, where you make a recording of samples, you go back to it a month later and you have no idea what the data is, you don't know how to parse it, you don't know how it was stored. Uh, you don't remember what frequency it was at or what you were actually recording to begin with. It's kind of like going back and looking at your own code, except worse. Um, it's also, it's impossible to, it, well, not impossible, but it's extremely difficult to, not for just for you to make use of it, but for anybody else to make use of it. So we set out to define a standard that we thought would fix this problem. Uh, and, and we did it, we actually, we started completely from scratch, not looking at how anybody else had solved the problem. And there are some other solutions, and I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit later on in the presentation. There are some other ways people have looked at this. So we started out looking at, at how nobody else had done it and said, how would we do this if nothing existed? Um, and so these are the problems that we tried to solve. Um, why would it be useful? Uh, first of all, you don't, if, you have, if you have recorded signals and you can share them, you don't need hardware, right? There's plenty of people without hardware who want to uh, process signal data, and this would make that possible. Uh, signals you don't have access to, so uh, even if you have hardware station or hardware receivers set up, you don't have them set up necessarily everywhere that, that you might be interested in getting recordings of data from. Uh, reproducibility, so this was a major one for us. Uh, one of, for example, one of the major aspects in the technical proceedings of GRCon is that the published papers provide uh, the source code or the Gen Radio flow graphs or the data sets that they used in their research or in uh, their experimentation. Uh, but a lot of times, again, kind of like producing source code without, without documentation or examples, um, just publishing a data set does not mean that it is usable by anybody else, right? Uh, you can't just dump a binary file on somebody and expect them to be able to make sense of it. Uh, so, how do you share a data set that allows somebody else to reproduce work that you've already done? Uh, collaborative processing. So, this one actually I, I think is really interesting. The concept of, uh, you know, you can process a data set and point out features in it or, or uh, uh, do some, some sort of conditioning on it and then give it to somebody else and have them not only see what you've done but build on top of it, right, in, in sort of a serial fashion. Uh, being able to provide effectively what are code comments for signal data, um, which can be everything from, hey, I detected a particular feature here to uh, my cat knocked over the antenna and messed up this four seconds of data. Um, creating feature and characteristic annotations. Uh, so this one is especially particularly important given uh, all of the work that's being done right now in, uh, in sensors, especially with machine learning. Uh, and finally, and I talked a little bit about this yesterday morning, uh, right, and kind of the, the, the way the community is changing, and we have a lot of different people here uh, who use a lot of different tools, and GNU Radio is very often uh, just one tool in the toolbox, and most people are not purists. Uh, right now, there's really not an easy way to move data between different tools, right? So if your workflow, for example, is doing something in MATLAB, and then you go to GNU Radio, and then you go to uh, something like, um, uh, you deploy with like deploying with liquid DSP or something else, for example, and you're trying to find a way to actually move data between all of these different tools and workflows. 
such that you don't actually have to write your own translation layer for each step. That can be quite painful. Um, and that same problem exists not just for you alone, but for you know, anybody you're working with. So as a, as a higher level example, uh, here's an example usage scenario. A receiver monitors some piece of spectrum, records the data, which is then processed by a signal detection and classification and engine, the results of which want, you want to be visualized by some human operator. So most of the solutions that we saw when we started looking at this were effectively monolithic systems. Uh, there was no way for, you couldn't separate the receiver from the detection and classification engine from the visualization software. They all had to be co-designed, right? They all came from a single vendor or they all, uh, they all adhered to the same general, this is the, same, the same general structure that were generally, usually proprietary. So our goal was to define an open standard that would allow this kind of example scenario. So SIGMF is an open standard. It is itself released under the Creative Commons uh, attribution share alike license. Uh, it is, if you look at the structure, it's based very loosely on uh, IETF RFC. So if, if you're familiar with those and you look at it, you'll see a lot of the same, uh, a lot, a lot of the same clauses and that sort of thing. Um, the metadata is written in JSON. So I have a special hatred for XML. It makes my eyes bleed. Uh, I'm very happy that we migrated to YAML and GNU Radio. Uh, but JSON especially is really exploding in terms of uh, shared metadata in Internet realm, uh, Internet realm specifically. But it's very, very portable. And you can get very, very small JSON parsing engines which was important for us because we want this to be usable on embedded systems. Uh, it's also fairly readable by humans. So again, we really wanted to do this not just for GNU Radio, but we wanted to solve it in a way that would be useful for everybody, regardless of your workflow. Um, and we've actually, we've had a pretty significant uh, amount of contrib contributions from people who were not directly involved within the GNU Radio project, which has been neat. So we started this, like I said, we started this in February at the DARPA Hackfest in Brussels. And a month later, uh, so we, we had a very, very early draft of the standard up. It was, and I'm, by early, I mean really early. Like it was littered with typos. I had broken the, the markdown formatting in it. Uh, it, was, it was a little rough. And I was at Dicepan, and uh, Tom had asked me to give a brief presentation on SIGMF, and I, Tom's, Tom's not here yet, right? I think he gets in a little bit later today. Yeah, you're not in the room. So he asked me to give a brief presentation on SIGMF. I'm like, okay, that's cool. This will be fun. So I'm sitting in the audience. This is Paul Tillman uh, kicking off the DARPA Dice Band Modigrec Challenge. And in case you can't see the slide, he's saying that all results must be submitted in the SIGMF format. So <laughs> I, I, I kind of started panicking, and I took a picture of this and sent it to everybody working on the SIGMF standard. I said, we, had, we have two hours to fix every typo in the standard. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we've, um, I'm, I'm going to run through a little bit about how, how SIGMF works, try to give you some idea of the way it's structured. Um, so we think about this in, in, in forms of two different types of applications, writer applications and reader applications. So when I say writer applications, I don't mean applications that are writing IQ data. I mean applications that are writing metadata. Uh, for the most part, writing IQ data can be done, right, there's command line programs you can run with an RTL dongle that just dump binary data to disk, right? Um, and we, we, we have some requirements about how, by, how about how the data is written to disk, but that's a much simpler problem to solve than actually writing the metadata. And the primary reason for that is you wanna be able to write metadata in a streaming fashion. Right, so if you are processing a stream of samples, um, which for the most part, we, we've, we're thinking of this from the perspective of radio, so processing a stream of IQ samples um, and you're doing inline detection on it. Uh, don't wanna be in a scenario where you're having to buffer every single detection comment or annotation that you're creating and then writing it to disk down the road, especially if you're doing this processing continuously for long periods of time, right? We want to be able to process it, and as you're processing it in parallel, stream your metadata to disk. So the standard must be written in a way that supports that. 
Um, it also must be written in a way that doesn't fill up your disk with useless data, which would be very, very easy. Um, so, for example, if, uh, if you have a continuously volatile field that describes your radio, uh, let's say your uh, radio is moving, for example, um, or your antenna is moving, uh, how, how, do you, how do you describe these things without cluttering your metadata so much that it's impossible to make sense of later? Uh, from the reader, so readers are applications that read metadata and samples. And we also want to do this, be able to do this in a streaming fashion. So if you have a huge data set and you're pulling all of that in and you're also processing the metadata, we want reader applications to be able to basically look at the metadata and apply it to the binary samples in real time and not have to load the entire metadata file, which could be quite large, into memory and then sort of jump around and figure out how it applies to what. Um, and we, must be, we also have to be able to do that unambiguously. So thinking about this, are we, are the, the principles that we used to really design this were we wanted to make it as straightforward as possible for developers to create reader and writer applications. Uh, whether that's in Guna Radio or elsewhere, we want anybody to be able to do this. So we're defining a core standard. Uh, the standard itself is namespaced and the canonical namespace is core. So things that we think are an absolute requirement are in a core namespace, but we've given you the ability to create extension namespaces. So for example, if you're interested in creating uh, uh, sensor-specific data, right? There's nothing in core that is specific to sensors, but core would allow you to understand how to, well, core allows you to understand, the, to understand the capture itself, and then you could create an extension namespace that you could define yourself that says, hey, this is, these are the sensor fields that I'm using, and this is how it applies to this data. So with all standards, one of the major questions is how do you, how do you deal with compliance? Um, and that applies to both applications and metadata. So uh, by that I mean, if you say an let's say you say an application is compliant, if you say a reader application is compliant, what does that mean? And if you say metadata is compliant, what does that mean? Uh, our goal is to be able to say if you have a compliant metadata file and you have a compliant reader application, you are guaranteed to, at a, at a basic level, be under, to be able to understand that recording. You might not be able to understand the extension namespace, but you will be under, able to understand the recording. And we want to do that while keeping it small. So a SIGMF recording is comprised of one data file and one metadata file only. You ne we never, never have a one-to-many relationship. The data file is just samples raw samples, and the metadata file is JSON. So we've defined other structures. There's a directory structure for storing multiple recordings in a single archive, uh, and how, how that directory structure looks and how it can be distributed. Um, but fundamentally, it is one-to-one. -one. So high-level structure. The three major questions for a data set really are, how do I understand the files that I have? Once you figure that out and you understand you have a binary data file and a metadata file, how do you understand the samples? And how do you understand the metadata? So fundamentally, those are the three, three questions that we think need to be solved. So we provide three high-level structures within the metadata that solves these three questions. So uh, global. There's a field called global, and it provides only general information about the file. It exists only once in, in all of the metadata. So it tells you, for example, what the data type of the stored samples are. Is it, uh, is it a complex, unsigned integer? Or is it a real float, for example? Uh, the version of the standard, right? If we make backwards incompatible changes, you need to that to define how the samples are written to a file. You need to know that. Before you go open the, file, the, 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 the signal capture, you need to know how it's written. So it's things like a version field. Um, a license, if, if the author wants to provide a specific 
for example, a Creative Commons license that governs how the data can be used. Uh, how can you guarantee that if I create a recording and I give it to somebody and that person hands it to somebody else, that that person didn't modify the data before passing it on, <laughs> thus rendering the metadata that I attached to it um, not useful, right? So we solve that problem with hashes. So th these are the sorts of things that are in the global structure. Next is captures. So the captures object um, is an array of segments, and the array of segments terms can be a little confusing. I'll show you an example of what that looks like later. Hopefully it makes more sense. But the idea of captures is to solve the problem again of how do you understand the samples. So it contains only what you need to understand the samples at a basic level, which is what is the sampling rate? What is the time what is a timestamp attached to a particular sample index? What is the center frequency? That sort of thing. Uh, there's nothing else in the captures, captures array. It is simply how do you understand the binary data? And then lastly are what we call annotations. So the annotations are what you add. So it's this, I classified a signal, this is what it is, uh, this is when it starts, this is when it ends, I detected interference, um, my cat knocked over the antenna, it's really everything else. So the mapping metadata to samples is done by sample index only. Uh, so this, effectively what this means is you are mapping metadata to time. Now there doesn't necessarily have to be a defined time stamp of the samples. Um, they could just be, imply if it's zero, then it's zero. But uh, everything is mapped in terms of samples. So when you, when, you def when you say I have this particular annotation or I detected a signal or this is what happened here, your, that metadata tag is mapped to a sample index in the binary file. So one of the things that's under, that we're working on discussing right now is actually how to, how to create annotations in frequency. Uh, and we're not gonna change this fundamental structure but what we'll probably do is to say, if you would define something in frequency, you can say this is the time at which this starts in frequency, and then it, it is continuous, it never goes away. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fundamentally mapped to sample index. So this is what um, a very, very basic metadata file looks like. Uh, so at the very top, you can see the global, the global segment, so this is, the, this is just four items here. Um, there are many more that are optional, but these are, the, these are four items. Actually, description is optional as well. So the data type tells you how the samples are stored. All samples must be written in UTF-8 encoding. So here, these are UTF-8 encoded CF32 samples. They are stored at a sample rate of 10 megahertz, and it's using the SIGMF version 0.0.1. Fundamentally, that's all you would need to understand the other two files in the SIGMF recording. The capture array then tells you how the data was stored, which is how, what you need to actually understand the binary samples. So uh, each segment you can see has a sample start field, which tells you, again, that's the mapping from that particular segment to uh, an index in the binary file. So here we're saying, okay, this segment, this particular capture segment, starts at the very beginning of the file. Uh, it was recorded at 900 megahertz, this is the timestamp at sample zero. That's it. Uh, so when a reader application reads this in, they'll see that and say, okay, samples, starting at sample zero, I'm at 900 megahertz with this timestamp, remembering I am, this is CF32 data at 10 megahertz. If there are no other capture arrays, none of those parameters change. So capture, capture segments are only, only generated when some piece, when some part of the parameters change. So then you can see here at sample uh, 100,000, the radio is retuned. So start, starting at sample 100,000, the radio frequency is now 950 megahertz. And so from then on, those are the parameters of the system. And then as an example annotation, you can see here at the bottom, uh, sample start, so here we're saying, uh, we're adding just a comment. Some text, some, some text comment about stuff happening, which is not terribly useful. Uh, so you got a sample start, which is um, 
Uh, here is one millionth, so we're saying at the one millionth sample uh, lasting for 120,000 samples, this particular comment applies. So this is a very, obviously, succinct sort of example of what this looks like. Uh, but fundamentally, this is what a SIGMF metadata file uh, represents. So one of our major problems in this, and I kind of actually, I mentioned this earlier, like it was an easy problem to solve. One of our major problems while we were writing this was trying to figure out how to handle highly volatile fields, like geolocation or spinning radar dishes, uh, something that's changing continuously. And we, we kept going back and forth on you know, how, if you look at this structure, right, how, how would you do that in a way that doesn't uh, completely crush a reader application? So, for example, if you, if you have a spinning radar dish where the azimuth is changing constantly, uh, do, would, you, would we provide some, some equation of the changing azimuth in the capture annotation segment? What about geolocation? How do you, how do you say, how do you interpolate geolocation between every single sample without providing a geolocation tag for every single sample? Which is not, which is we didn't want to do because it would burden things so heavily. So we had talked about this for a long time and nobody could figure it out. Nobody had, was coming up with good ideas. This completely random person. Is Vin's 87 in the room? No? So nobody knows who this guy is. Uh, he just, he just posted in, so all of, the, all of our work is done on GitHub, so uh, the debates and discussions about what happens in the standard are all in GitHub issues and pull requests. So we've been having this, this, this discussion about how do we solve this problem for, for months, and this rando just posts, and it's like, well, it's just another, it's just another recording. Just treat it like another signal capture. Uh, and he's right. F fundamentally, it's just another signal capture. Right? It doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to be samples. Um, a changing, a changing geolocation is just a signal. Uh, changing radar uh, or, cha or changing antenna azimuth is just a signal. So uh, he solved our problem in a tremendously elegant way. No idea who he is. The only other work he's done on, based on his GitHub is writing bots for Tinder. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not blaming him at all. I just, I mean. I don't, I don't even, yeah, I've, Vens, if you ever watch this YouTube video, you're awesome. Uh, it's the magic of open source, right? So um, the draft of the standard is live on GitHub. We're actively discussing and making changes since, so like I said, everything is done through issues and pull requests. Uh, since this went live in, um, in February, we've closed, I think, 28 issues and merged 28 25 pull requests, so I might have the numbers reversed. Uh, so discussion is ongoing. Uh, so far, in addition to the standard itself, we have a Python validator for SIGMF files. Um, again, thank you very, very much to Doug Anderson from NTIA, who's put a lot of work into building some of the code infrastructure that's in there right now. Um, there's an alpha web front end for a validator where you can drop a SIGMF metadata file and say, no, you, you did this wrong. Um, there's, we have involvement from a number of other communities. So again, this is not just about Goon Radio. So uh, uh, Joe Gator, the author, the, the author of Liquid DSP, uh, Mike from Inspectrum, the Q, the Q Spectrum Analyzer, the Cubic Analyzer, uh, Ultimate Radio Hacker. I know I'm saying that application name wrong. We have lots and lots of other signals-based uh, application authors who are involved in giving us feedback. Um, Kevin Reed, the author of Shiny SDR at Google, has been very, very active in providing feedback and changes to the specification. Uh, so our, our goal really is to create something that would allow you to move data between all of these different tools in a useful way. Uh, so things to do, uh, please give us, give us feedback, ask questions, um, submit simple pull requests, everything. You know, the interesting thing about uh, standards and is that it being extremely precise is extremely important. Uh, so even submitting an issue that says, hey, it looks like you know, this, this sentence is structured in a confusing way, like that is helpful because everyone who reads the standard needs to walk away with the same understanding of it. Um, somewhat embarrassingly, we do not have 
You can radio source and sync blocks yet for this. Uh, there are actually several that exist in private repositories and private labs, but they are not public. So we desperately need canonical GNU Radio source and sync blocks for these. Uh, static visual visualization tools, so basically an example reader application where you read in uh, a sample file, it applies the metadata, and you can scroll around and see how it's pointing to stuff. We would really like to have a slick logo. We don't have one. If any graphic designers are in the room and want to contribute, that's a great way. Otherwise, just tell everyone that this is awesome for us. So come get involved. Everything, I, like I said, everything's on GitHub. Everything's done in the issues and pull requests. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. So I have time for, yep, we've got five minutes for questions. What's up, EJ? Um, Jose, can you get to him? Oh, and um, we'll get the next presenter up here. Start getting mic'd up. Uh, so my first question is, um, about the sample rate metadata yep. parameter, is that something that um, by default you're assuming is static throughout the entire file, or is that something that could be changed um, with like the center frequency? Excellent question. And we had a long discussion about this, and sample, the sample rate is not, is immutable for a recording. So if you change the sample rate during a recording, you must create a new recording. What's, what's the motivation behind doing that as opposed to leaving it up to the implementer's choice? Sure, so going back to the driving principles, if you remember, we really, really wanna make it as straightforward as possible for people to create uh, compliant reader applications. And so in talking to a lot of the people who are creating reader applications, like InSpectrum and QSpectrum Analyzer, um, Shiny SDR, what they would have to do to visualize and map metadata and interpolate between the changing sample indices when a sample rate change occurs. Right. It was just too confusing. And like the four people who commented all came up with different interpretations of what it should look like. And like this is this is not gonna work. So we'd already we'd already thought of a way to include multiple recordings in a single archive. So like the answer is simply if you change the sample rate, you create a new create you create a new recording, you stick it in the same archive. Okay. Um, so um, cut, cut me off and ask too many questions, but I got a lot of questions. So um, with the, uh, the different time series uh, data sets, so if you want to include GPS or a rotating antenna, is that something that you have a separate time series file with a separate SIGMF, or is that something that can have multiple time series data sets tied together with a single SIGMF metadata format file? So the, everything is simply a SIGMF recording. So going back to the original rules, a SIGMF recording is one metadata file, one data file, okay. always. So if you have, let's say you make a signal capture, and in addition to your signal capture, you have a, a ch changing geolocation and you have a changing radar or changing antenna azimuth, right? So you would have three SIGMF recordings and they would all have information that links them together, but you have three SIGMF recordings. And I'll note that also makes it easier for reader and writer applications who don't necessarily care about your geolocation, for example, to make sense of the rest of the data. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was another, again, keep, we wanna keep it as simple as possible to create a compliant application. Okay. If somebody doesn't care about what your antenna is, they don't have to read that recording. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, real quick, one more. So the, the, one of the red flags I had uh, at least when using the file MetaSync in GNU Radio as is, mm -hmm. is that it does this look back thing where uh, after it writes metadata, it'll go and edit the tags of a previous uh, metadata item. And um, if you have, so when you have the git, uh, when you have the hash of the data in your header, is that something that's gonna break when you start to uh, write files and then have to keep, this, keep track of this hash um, and, and do a, a sync, a metadata sync? So the hashes are only for the signal data itself, not for the metadata. So the goal is to be able to protect the integrity of the signal data, so that if I give you a signal file and you change it or it gets messed up, you, know effect, you effectively know that the metadata I've given you is not useful. Um, changing metadata is, we don't really care about, I mean, we, well, we care about it, but we're not worried about the integrity of it, if that makes sense. Okay. What's up, Bob? Uh, so uh, the, the thing I'm worried about is in the metadata files not having a time indexing or a time mark for where the individual entry 
you're doing, say you're doing something dynamic and you okay. need to know the time registration, have you thought of that? All right, so uh, let me, actually let me ask a clarifying question. Uh, are you asking about having a, a time stamp for like a, one of the metadata segments? Yeah, and, and an easy ability to search it without having to do a linear search. So are you asking for a timestamp of when that particular metadata was created or a timestamp? Yep, yep. The, in, the individual input entry into the metadata file, yep. you often want to know when an event occurs, and if you're th storing stuff in a metadata file, not having to do a linear search on that would be a big deal. So yeah, that's a good point. So there actually is a time field already defined, but it's not a required field. So the example that I showed uh, of that very short version, for the exception of the description text line, all of those fields were only the required fields. Um, and if you want to add a timestamp, you can. And there's a field specifically for that. But yeah, yeah, you're right. Any other questions? I have, oh, what's up, Skylar? Oh, oh we got several. OK. Oh, OK. Um, the data set format, it would this ever consider anything but flat files? No, no. So uh, we are, we, we have also had long conversations about this. We want to keep the signal files completely flat. We don't want reader applications to have to load complicated, you know, file structure parsing uh, engines to move through these things. So if you have a multi-day recording, you would suggest just breaking it up into different Yeah, you can pieces. break it, yeah, exactly. And there's a field, so one of the non-required fields is a, is a index offset. So you can say, this recording is part two. The very first sample in this recording is index offset 10 million. So you know, okay, this is part two. Starting at the beginning, I'm 10 million. Starting at number three, I'm 20 million, whatever. So we've, we provided a way for you to be able to read in multiple recordings and understand that, they're, that it's a continuous set but not to have non-flat files. And the other question is uh, the tuning frequency example you gave at the sample that the tuning frequency changed. It's hard to know when the driver is going to set that tuning frequency and exactly know what sample came back because the yep. driver is not in nanoseconds, but your samples are. Yep. Yeah, and that's an interesting problem. So, uh, so his, his, his question is different radios are going to settle on parameter changes at different times, right? And you don't always know within your writer application when that change has taken effect, right? And yeah, I, we don't have a, we really don't have a way to solve that within the SIGMF standard. Um, you know, there's, there's some radios that provide uh, effectively coherent timing from the ADC that you can get, we can get pretty close with, but for radios that don't, it's, it's gonna be a best effort, so yeah. Thanks. Um, wow, okay, so we have, one, two, three, four, five questions. I'm already over time. Uh, all, right, so, all right, yeah, so. You mentioned that frequency, ta that tags based on frequency would be permanent once they're added. Why not make it where there's a time duration that they apply to? For example, you might want to annotate a signal that then disappears later. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, Skylar. You should post it on the GitHub issue. I'm serious, by the way. We're like, the, like that discussion just started a couple weeks ago. Uh, I forget who, who said I would really like to be able to annotate in frequency and never have to touch it again. Um, so we're, yeah, we're just now talking about that. That's a really good idea. It'd be great if you added that to the discussion. What's up, Nick? So you did mention early in your talk that you would address some of the you know, competitive uh, oh, yeah. approaches to this. I think just a couple words on that would be helpful for yeah, everyone. Yeah, especially since I neglected to do that. Um, so the major one that we're aware of is HDF5. Uh, which is used by NASA, NOAA, and several others. Uh, this is a hierarchical, self-describing, structured system. Um, and it allows you to do pretty much anything. I've never used HDF5 myself. My knowledge of it actually comes mostly from talking to people at uh, various, Sandia and Los Alamos, especially uh, Jennifer Estrada, are you in the room? Yes, Jennifer provided excellent feedback uh, between HDF5 and um, SIGMF. So, HDF5 could do everything SIGMF could do. The, the two biggest differences are uh, HDF5 is far more complicated, and it's much more difficult to actually create applications that are capable of making sense of it. And B, there's not, a, there's, there's not really a concept of what it means to be compliant. And that's important for us, because what one of our goals, right, is 
I give you a recording, I say this was written with a compliant writer, my metadata is compliant, you have a compliant reader, you are guaranteed to be able to make sense of that data, right? That doesn't exist with HDF5. So the one, um, the one HDF5 instance that I know where someone attempted to do it specifically for GNU radio data, they also specifically called out VITA49 in their write-up and why they didn't address it with VITA49. I'm just curious if you have thought about that. Uh, we've had some discussions about it, but I'd be in I actually am interested to talk about that more. Yeah. All right, I, I have to stop now, because I really have to give it to John. Uh, so if you have questions, please come find me. Uh, like I said, this is Android Active Development. We're, this sounds crazy, but like this standards process, I think, is actually really exciting. Uh, so come talk to me about it. I love talking about it. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it to John.